Okay, we're back. This week, oh boy, this week we're going to talk about tools. Um, I'm really just kind of going to go over basic stuff. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time this week. I talked yours off last week, but I probably will talk yours off this week too, but you already know that. Um, so, you're brand new, you got nothing. Where do you start? Um, first thing, you need some place to work. Um, this is my uh, workshop. It's actually in the utility part of my basement. Um, there's a bunch of junk in here, and my stash shelves are actually on the other side over there. But we're not going to talk about that right now. So I actually have I have a desk here. Um, it's about 48 by 24. Um, I have a workbench here that's maybe five foot by 24 deep here. And then I call this my stand up bench. Um, about 24 by three foot wide. Um, all of these bookcases and, and things that you see up here, I salvage these. Um, out of different places um, you know so none of this stuff cost me anything um, so yeah so you need a space first of all you need a space second of all you need light and if you're old you need lots of light <laughs> um, you know my 13 year old can come down here and and put individual track links together um, without any magnification whatsoever um, because he has great eyesight. Um, I can't do anything. Oh, well, there's few things that I can't do without magnification anymore. Um, well, you know, something like this I can. But, but anyway, um, so you need a place. You need light. Obviously, you need a kit. Um, so you got your place, you got your light, you got your kit, now what? Well, you got to get the parts off the sprue, right? Somehow. Um, various ways to do that. Uh, the good old number two exacto, number two handle with the number 11 blade. Um, a workhorse for many, 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 many people. Um, was for me for years and years and years. Um, I still use them, but not as much as I used to. Uh, for a couple of reasons. They're not that sharp. And basically what I use them for now is when I need to be able to trim something or whatever, and I need, I need a blade that's, that's um, stable, that's not flimsy. Um, but... I also use it to scribe. Use the backside of the scribe and stuff. So there's that. Um, then what you probably graduate up to, or if you need to go something further, is get a pair of uh, these little nippers. Um, these happen to be. Uh, I've had these for years. They're for electrical wire, but you know they're all basically the same thing. You'll get them. You'll get them labeled for different things. I have. I don't know, I have five or six pair of these floating around. That are, one's for jewelry and one's sold for... Um, I have one pair that's sold specifically for modeling. I have a pair that's sold as a... Oh, what was it? I don't remember. Anyway. And I... I you got to make sure that you don't use these for anything other than plastic. I... Uh, I made the mistake of uh, using one of them to nip off the uh, ends of the guitar strings on one of my guitars when I was changing strings and it ruined them. But that's okay. So I just use those for that now. Um, going back to the Exacto, what I use now, um, if I'm trying to get something off the sprue that is a tight spot or whatever, 
There's a, there's a, I used a scalpel. And I think this is a number 23 or 24 blade. I also have a number 11 scalpel. Um, there's really no reason not to have these. They're much sharper than, a, than an X-Acto. They're very cheap. You get the handle and 100 blades for about 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, and they work great. They're really, there's all different kinds of blade shapes. Go on to Google, look up um, surgical blade shapes, and they'll show you a chart. And um, yeah, you can, I love these things. These are great. Um, and probably what I love more than anything is my uh, my little JL seesaw here. Um, it's not a seesaw; it's a JLC saw. <laughs> um, UMM USA sells these. I'm sure other people do too. Um, this is a really, really fine tooth saw. Um, great tool. I use this all the time. I Probably 80% of the things I take off of the sprue on a kit, I, t I take off with this. Um, you know those little bitty thin like pipes and stuff, you know, that they have with these huge sprue gates and you, you can't cut them off because they break when you try and cut them off. You can cut them off with this without breaking them. No problem. Um, highly recommended. Um, Okay, you got the parts off the sprue, now what? Well, you got to clean them up, right? You got to sand the edges. Um, a couple ways, I mean, of course, you're going to use your knife to scrape. You can scrape things off or trim things up with your knife. Um, if you're going to do that, I would recommend the scalpel rather than the exacto. But if you, like I said, if it's something that that you're going to need some blade strength on, you're going to want to use the, the X-Acto because these are thin and flexible. They don't, they, 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 they deform. Um, but anyway, trim stuff off, sand stuff off. I buy these here in the U.S. I get these at uh, Sally's Beauty Supply. They're the Tropical Shine Sticks. Um, they have four or five different grades. I get the black, the blue, and the pink here, or red, or whatever this is. I'm red, red, green deficient, so if I say a color and it's not right, sorry. <laughs> um, and I got my little flexi file sander here. This allows you to sand curves without flattening them. Um, you can use sanding sponges to do that, various things, um, whatever. All right, so you got your parts cleaned up. Now you're going to put stuff together. And you're inevitably going to have little things that need to go into little places that you can't get your fingers into, which means you need tweezers. Tweezers, tweezers, tweezers. Um, I would recommend... You get at least a pair of straight and a pair of curved. Um, and maybe even a pair of self-closing ones or spring-closed ones or, that are normally closed. Um, you know, that'll hold the part for you without you having to put tension on it. Um, I probably have 20 pair of tweezers. And, and a lot of them are the same, but... Um, you know, these are very inexpensive. I get these. These come out of a grab bin at my LHS. I don't know. I'm sure there's some Chinese thing or something, but they're they're stainless steel. Um, I don't know. It says India. And they're, I don't know, I think a buck and a quarter or two bucks. Two bucks a pair or something. You know, I don't know. They're not very much. Here's some that have plastic tips and a bunch of crap on them. The plastic tips um, for things that you don't want to mess up okay so you got a little detail parts parts put on let's say something like this or, or whatever you need you're gonna need clamps 
you're going to need something to hold this thing together while it's drying, you know, to keep the glue, the glue together on it. Um, even down here on the wings, you know, you need to clamp the wings. So, um, clothespins work great. Um, these are inexpensive. I think it's like three bucks for 50. They work pretty good in most situations. Um, vice clamps. Um, I don't use these a whole lot. Um, you get into something like this that's capable of, of applying a lot of pressure, you need to be careful that you don't apply too much pressure, obviously. Um, so, um, but I have clothespins, I have those, I have these, you know, um, quick grip clamp, quick grip clamps. Um, I have a bunch of those. I have something else. Oh, spring clamp. Um, those are actually pretty big for what we do, but I've got smaller ones. So yeah, you need clamps. Um, another thing you can use as a clamp is rubber bands. Um, and another thing you can use is tape. I wouldn't use this because this is to me a tape, and I, it's too expensive to use for just holding things together in my opinion. Um, scotch tape, masking tape, whatever. If you're going to use tape, actually if you're going to use anything that goes across the seam line where you're putting cement, we didn't talk about cement, but we will, where you're putting cement, you need to be very careful that you don't that the cement doesn't follow the rubber band or whatever and follow it out of the seam and, and craze the plastic and ruin the surface. Um, really, the only way to avoid that if you're using uh, liquid glue is to not use those things and to use clamps, you know, these other types of clamps instead. You can do some interesting things. You can use um, pipe cleaners, wrap them around here, twist them tight. Um, pretty much anything you can think of will work. Okay, um, so speaking of clamps, where's my glues? There's my glues. Um, glue, you're going to need glue. There's a million different types of glue out there. Um, you know, we all grew up using the old tube glue. How do I say this nicely? Don't use that stuff. <laughs> Get rid of that stuff. We don't need it. I'm sorry about the background noise. They're watching TV upstairs and, you know. Um, so, I use various different things. Um, this is the infamous Tamiya Extra Thin. I have this. I have the, the Tamiya Standard. Um, Tanax. Um, Prowell. You know, these are all the chemical bond, or, uh, solvent, solvent cements. They're all some kind of xylene or MEK or toluene or, or something, you know, that's that works. There's people out there that use acetone, this and that and the other thing. I've given up this um, and replaced it with this. Now, I've got blue tape on this so that I know what it is. Um, it's, it's obviously an old Tamiya bottle, but this is MEK. Methyl ethyl ketone. Um, this is some pretty wicked stuff. I'll tell you right now, all of these stuffs, all this, these are all poisons. So, and I'm not telling you that to scare you or anything, but just be aware that none of these things are good for you. Um, but the reason I went switch to MEK, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is, is this bottle is $5. Uh, I think I paid $12 for a quart. 
of MEK. Um, this is does it say how many milliliters it is? It doesn't. At least not that I can say. Anyway, and it's not that this is not good stuff. It is. This is hotter. Hotter meaning it melts the plastic better, more, worse, more. <laughs> um, highly volatile. Um, yeah, I let my son use it, but uh, sparingly. Um, I'm already polluted at my age, so I don't worry too much about myself. Um, of course, there's super glue. Um, I try not to use a lot of super glue because, you know, it doesn't have any shear strength. And it, so it just, it doesn't, I don't know, it just, I use it more for filling than I do for actually attaching things. I'll do it in some cases where I'm trying to get something um, to, to, that'll set up pretty quick. And I don't use an accelerator, I just hold it. You know, if you can hold it for a few seconds, it'll usually set up. Um, so yeah, so you got everything glued, you got everything clamped together, what now, you take the clamps off, you start looking. Okay, now you got gaps or you got whatever you got. At this point, basically you're up, now you're up to the point where, okay, I've got a basic model assembled. Now here's where you can do whatever you want to do. You want to fill the gaps? You not want to fill the gaps. Are you going to paint it? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. You know, built a lot of kit kits when I was a kid. I didn't paint a single one of them. Not until, I don't know, I was, I, I really don't know, 10, 12, 13? I, I don't remember when I actually started painting things. Um, so, you know, if you're fine with where you're at and you've got decals and you just want to put decals on and, and be done with it, great. Have at it. Um, if you just want to paint it, regardless of the, the gaps and stuff and, and finish it all up, that's great too. If you want to fill gaps and stuff, you're going to need a gap filler. Um, like I said, you can use super glue. I use super glue a lot of times in a place where there's a step. Um, well, for instance, on the top of this, uh, there was a step here between the two sides. I still got a little bit of sanding to do here, but so I was able to uh, fill it with the super glue and then, you know, you let it sit for about 20, 30 minutes, let it harden up, and then take the sanding sticks to it. Um, you don't want to let it go any too much longer because eventually it'll get so hard that <laughs> it's, you have a really hard time with it, which uh, it looks like I might have done here. Um, so we'll see. I'll have to deal with that. Anyway, um, there are water-based putties, acrylic putties, or whatever you want to call them. Um, I'm not a fan, um, and I know there's a lot of guys out there that love water-based putties and, and stuff. The issue I have with them is it seems like they just don't bond to the plastic or to the seam or whatever, and when I go to, it seems like it's just, I'm, I'm putting on coat after coat after coat because I'm tearing the stuff out when I'm sanding it or whatever. So, like I said, I, I know it works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for me. Um, what I use in a lot of cases is this Bondo glazing and spot putty. I've been using this for years and so have a lot of other guys. Um, it works pretty good. And and if you're careful, you can actually smooth this out 
with a sponge dipped in lacquer thinner. Um, obviously, you don't want to be on the plastic too long with that because you'll melt the plastic. Um, so you have to be pretty quick. But you can, I've, I've done, what was the last one I think I used this on? It was really bad. Oh, the Edward, one of the Edward defaults D3. The wing root on that thing's horrible. And I did that with this, and I just shoved a bunch of this in there and took a, a makeup sponge, dipped it in a lacquer thinner, and rubbed it across there a couple of times. And that was it. I didn't even have to sand it. Um, but again, you got to be careful with that lacquer thinner. It will eat the plastic. Um, I haven't had an issue with this eating plastic. People say, I've been warned that it will. I, I haven't had it happen myself, at least not that I've known it. Um, so, you've got the thing put together, you've got all the gaps filled and whatnot. Now what? Now it's paint time, right? Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. If you've got any kind of transparencies or anything that need to be masked off, you need to do that now, if you haven't already done it. Um, that can be done with masking tape. It can be done with liquid mask, any a number of things. I'm going to do a whole nother setup on, on paint, so I don't want to really get too far, too much into paint right now. You know, you got to choose your type of paint, um, all kinds of things. Um, brush, airbrush, um, whatever. But if you're getting into painting, what you will need when you're getting into painting is you're going to need good paint brushes either way for your detail painting and whatnot, regardless. Um, this is a red sable brush. This is kind of what I prefer. But in all honesty, I watch for sales and I take advantage of sales. And I mean, I have some new brushes hanging up here. I have my toolbox out that I've probably got. 20 or 30 brushes that are still in the package. Um, I'm not one of those guys that can make paint brushes last a lifetime. Sorry. <laughs> so, so I have to replace them once in a while. Um, and, you know, there's the airbrush. And this one is the needle stuck. Hmm. Well, we'll deal with that later. But, um, and I can see why now. The uh, and that's a whole different ball game there. But uh, either way, you're gonna need to thin your paint. Um, don't let people fool you into believing you cannot do stellar finishes with a brush. I will tell you from personal experience, I have seen hand brushed camouflage jobs on large scale aircraft, like 132nd scale aircraft that were impeccable. Um, can you do some of the techniques with a, with a brush that, that you can do with an airbrush? No, you can, an airbrush opens up a whole different world of different shading techniques and stuff. But you can do perfectly acceptable work with a brush. Um, and anybody that tells you otherwise is, is not being honest, I guess. Or, or, you know, everybody speaks from their own experience. And, and my experience is I've seen some brush painted jobs that you would have never guessed were brush painted. Um, so, but either way, you're going to need to mix paint and you're going to need. Um, you're going to need the thin paint. Um, that's equally important whether you're brushing or airbrushing. Um, and for that, I use these little glass eyedroppers. You get these. They usually come in like a six-pack or an eight-pack or something. And they they do cost more than those disposable ones. But I don't dispose of these. 
You know, as long as you don't suck paint up into the bulb, it's pretty easy to clean this. You know, just rinse, rinse thinner through it or whatever you're using. I, I, well, I should say, I don't really use these a lot with acrylics. I use both acrylics and enamels. Um, and then I use different types of acrylics. So I'm like really confused when it comes to thinners. No. <laughs> but, so, and we'll get into all that stuff when the time comes. When we do, I'll do, a, like I said, I'll do a paint video. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, I guess that's it. We're going to, um, I got some other stuff around here that we'll talk about. Like a, I got a crock pot and I got a sonic uh, cleaner and I got, you know, other stuff that I've collected throughout the years that, um, that aren't necessities, but are definitely helpful. Um, and we'll talk about PE tools, and, and that might be surprising for some of you. You don't need one of those $100 PE bending tools. You don't. Um, but we'll talk about that then. All right. That's it for this week. Um, hopefully I'll be able to be back in here building in here sometime this week. It's uh, <laughs> There was mass cobwebs and everything in here. But it's, uh, I got those all cleared out. Um, yeah, it's kind of nice to have the shot back. We shall see. All right, guys, take care of the people you love, and uh, we'll see you next time.